Hello, everyone. Welcome to this, uh, this talk that's a co-developed talk between Spa and myself about what are our hopes and dreams for what open source AI could give us, not just in terms of the capabilities of AI itself, but what about the impact on society can we maybe expect to see, work towards, um, and how we need the full transparency into AI systems, both the software, methodologies, um, the models themselves, but also, very critically, the data used to train, validate, and fine tune those models. So, my name is Julia Ferrioli. Um, I'm clearly standing right underneath my picture. <laughs> Um, I work in, at AWS as an open source AI ML strategist. My background is in machine learning, um, if the talk about robotics didn't give it away, uh, though they are actually separate fields. I will stop there. But anyway, I'm excited to be here to talk about something that I haven't really been able to talk about in quite some time. So thank you for having me to the Linux Foundation. And I, also standing under the wrong picture in case you can't tell, uh, I'm Tom Calloway, uh, but most people in the open source community know me as Spot. Um, I am an open source technologist at AWS. There's lots of socials you can find me at. Um, and this is something that I think is uh, very important for us to think about and consider as we move forward before we get too far in this very quickly changing space. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today. We'll, doing, we'll be doing this dance. We're going we're gonna to dance back yeah. and forth a little bit. Um, so the statement that open is important to technology uh, should hopefully not be controversial at this venue. Um, but I want to answer the question as to why open is important for technology. And I think it's not anything to do with a license. The license is just an enabler. Open source makes it possible for people to collaborate without restrictions, without barriers. The saying that many hands make light work is brought into practice in these open source communities. And the results of that work have been the high quality technology solutions that we all depend upon today. Um, when I started working in open source 25 years ago, which is scary to say, uh, it was not a given that anyone would ever depend upon open source solutions in any real way. Maybe you could argue that some people were using it as a web server, but it was dismissed. It was laughed at in a lot of contexts. And yet today, you would be hard pressed to find anyone building any software of any substance without taking advantage of open source solutions. These open source building blocks allow you to spend the majority of your development time focused on the problems that matter to you. You no longer have to sit down and say, well, let me determine what the right solution is for parsing XML. Let me determine what the right solution is for minifying the JavaScript. You just get to sit down and say, I'm going to work on solving the problem that I want to solve. I'm going to build the applications that my customers need. And because you've got these building blocks that are high quality, customizable, transparent, you can have the highest confidence in that software. You can go back and audit it, you can review it, you can test it, and that is something you will never be able to get out of a black box solution. A proprietary vendor is always, always going to be motivated to lie to you <laughs> and oversell what that thing can do because they know that the likelihood that they will get caught in that lie is minimal. Open source doesn't get that opportunity. Open source never gets to lie about what it is and what it can do. So I wanna talk a little bit about how we make openness possible. How have we done this in the past? For software, we've used something called the open source definition, which took a philosophical framework of collaboration, transparency, sharing, and empowerment, and codified it into a legal one so that we could take licenses 
and hold them up against this definition and determine if they met the criteria. This structure ensured that every user, regardless of who they are, that they had the complete access and permissions to use, modify, study, and distribute. It doesn't discriminate on who you are or what you want to do. It doesn't require that you have a degree or a certification or even that you are an expert who can understand the code that you have access to. It sets the bar very high and it gives you everything that you could possibly need to take that software and build upon it and with it. So why is AI different? We've heard in this morning's keynotes um, a lot of ways that data and data sets are really important to creating these large language models and these large models, and any model. You can't do it without data. So the complexity of the systems um, from an algorithmic level, it involves science that's not necessarily accessible to everybody using AI tools, um, domain expertise, but also the, one, of the, uh, one of the parts that really makes it different is the heterogeneity of the different components involved. You've got the software, the data, and the humans. Because a lot of these models use human data for fine tuning or feedback mechanisms. And additionally, these systems are really difficult to explain. They're difficult to interrogate. There are a lot of advances being made to make that easier, but we're kind of at the same point where we have to know what questions to ask to be able to get the answers that we're looking for. Or answers that answer the questions <laughs> that we want to ask. So even those with expertise in the domain have a difficult time communicating what is actually going on inside these models. Um, and that, we, we've borrowed a lot of language. I have lots of opinions on the anthropomorphization of artificial intelligence and, um, and whatnot, but at the heart of the matter is explainability and interpretability. So truly open source AI, AI that makes all components involved in building the system freely available under an open source-like model, it might have life-changing impact beyond the systems themselves if we only allow ourselves to make bold moves and commit to openness. So what are some of the things we might see? I think we are already seeing more high quality data sets that are freely available through data, data catalogs, which gives us the ability to have more eyes validating the, and verifying the quality of those data sets, more incentives to create, compile, remix, domain-specific data sets, language-specific data sets, population-specific ones. And that can, in turn, reduce, result in reduced bias, better representation, and better research. So the publication of code as being a precondition for open for software being open source, as Spot mentioned, increased the quality of software being produced. It's not that software has no bugs. <laughs> I mean. All of my software has bugs. Yeah, I mean, my software is flawless. But um, <laughs> it being open allows you to ascertain the quality, lets you dive deep to figure out if it does what it says it does. With the uh, with open, high quality open data, we can evaluate if these models are representative of the populations 
that we want to reflect in our models. We can understand what value judgments are being made by the systems that we are depending upon. And so when we look at the publication of high quality data sets, we can ensure that we are preserving cultural artifacts that we want represent, represented in our systems. And other people can use those data sets for their own purposes and that can extend past the creation of machine learning systems. So high quality data in research is critical for drawing reasonable conclusions. Um, and there's a lot of research out there, who, I mean, who here reads some of the research papers that are going on in software engineering these days? There's, there's, there's good research and then there's not, not so good research. And some of the not so good research depends on data sets with unknown provenance, um, with data sets that aren't necessarily appropriate to the domain that they're studying. And so open data sets, an increase in open data sets, allows us to do better research in the spaces that we care about. And it reduces the burden on researchers to collect and refine that data. Maybe not, it doesn't eliminate it entirely because then we wouldn't be doing qualitative and quantitative research, but it helps, every little bit helps. And scientists may then be incentivized to open up their data even more than they do currently. And I'm happy to see the trend that more and more research is resulting in open data. But I think we can do more. So one of the things that's worth keeping in mind is that AI is here to stay. It's not, not going away. Um, earlier in one of the keynotes, there was a slide where they talked about the stages of AI, and I kind of laughed because I think we're well past all of the stages that they presented in the keynote this morning. Um, the last stage was AI for geeks, basically, that you know we're using it to help improve our programming, and I think we're past that. I think AI is already being something that everyday, normal, regular people are interfacing with, whether they know it or not. Um, and I don't think that we want to find ourselves in a position where only a select few have complete insight into the inner workings of AI systems and be at the mercy of the companies that run them. While AI systems are absolutely complex beasts, just as open source software created possibilities for developers learning on non-traditional paths, open source AI systems allow for a new generation of machine learning experts to come from anywhere. And it is crucial that open source AI systems come with all, not just some, but all of the pieces. We need to empower people to be able to study, inspect, and verify open source AI systems, not just to fix the bugs that are certainly present in their software, but to have a path to confirm that these systems are fair and equitable. We know that data gathering is inherently a biased operation. There is no magical set of guidelines that we can hand to people who generate and gather data to tell them how to avoid bias. What we can do is we can have broad community collaborative effort to look at data sets and understand and identify bias. One of the wonderful things that was mentioned in the keynote this morning was that a big part of the early process of building LLMs is to take a data set and remove the things that are unwanted, that are unneeded, that are duplicative. Without an open data set, how can you be sure what has been removed, what has been duplicated, what was valuable that was left behind, and what was not valuable that was kept? So as a parallel, 
How many folks are familiar with the whole XZ thing? Hopefully most of you. Yeah, that, 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 that was kind of embarrassing. And the first time I heard about that, I was on vacation and I was not supposed to be looking at anything. I was supposed to be completely disconnected and my phone would not stop going off as I was trying to turn it off. And I gave in and looked at it and just sighed, like of course this happens when I go on a disconnected vacation. Um, but in case you had also been living under a rock in that window of time, uh, there was a focused effort that was made, probably by a nation state actor, to socially engineer maintainer level access to an open source library called XZ. And the goal of doing this was to insert exploits into XZ that would then be triggered by SSH so that it would create a backdoor onto systems. And when I heard about this initially, I was very concerned about it. And I thought, this is going to be very damaging for open source. But the more I thought about it, the more I came to a different conclusion. This effort was caught and it was addressed before it was widely deployed. There was only a small fraction of users that were so forward edge that they were running the vulnerable version of XZ in any sort of system. Most people had not rolled it into production. It had not landed anywhere besides pre-release versions of major Linux distributions. But the person who caught it was not a security expert. They didn't even work for a security company. They weren't doing a security audit. <laughs> they were a database engineer at Microsoft who was diving deep into the XZ code to understand a performance regression in his login times that was annoying him. <laughs> and I think that's fantastic. Open source, that ability to do that, to be able to dive deep into something that is annoying or is making you curious or giving you the opportunity to verify. I want to understand why this has gotten slower. I want to understand why this has gotten weirder. I want to understand why it's making choices. XZ didn't say, oh, this is crypto, this is hard, you couldn't possibly understand this. We're going to not give you any of the hard parts. It didn't limit the access to experts. It didn't say you need to pre-register with us in order to see these complicated cryptographic algorithms. It gave everything to everyone. And we caught this before it became possibly what could have been one of the worst security disasters in history. Recently, I watched a demo of an AI-powered application which used a pre-built LLM, and then they took a job description as input, and they gave it to the LLM, and then they handed it a set of candidate resumes. And they asked the LLM to determine which one was the best fit for the job. I was troubled, to say the least, by this demo. Because you hope that a human is involved in that process somewhere. As someone that has looked for a job, you hope that there's an opportunity for a person to see that there is another person on the other side of that resume. But let's be real, practically speaking, companies are using this exact application model today to pre-screen resumes to identify candidates for consideration for interview. We need completely open source AI systems so that we can dive deep and understand how these systems make these choices, identify their biases, and improve them. And this requires more than just tuning weights and having distributable binaries. I do just want to give um, a positive example with um, being able to look into how machine learning models work. Um, does, is anyone familiar with Genderize, the library? It's a, it, it's a, it's a freely available um, library that basically you give it a name and it, and it ascertains the gender of the person behind that name. I'm not encouraging you to use this. But why it's a positive example is because it did disclose what data it was trained on, um, which allowed researchers 
to go in and figure out, you know what? This particular library has a 100% failure mode, 100% failure rate on people who are non-binary. It had a higher than average failure rate at people who um, are disabled, regardless of gender. Um, and so uh, us being able, or uh, us as in the community, being able to look and see what was actually going on in the inner workings of this library helps us to ascertain whether it's something that we should use, whether it's appropriate for our use case, whether we're satisfied with the results and how and what judgments it was making. And because we could tell the data that it was trained upon, we could understand that it was only trained on binary gender data. Our final, um, our final category of hopes and dreams for open source AI is more life-changing opportunities. With AI being applied to so many different domains, open source AI has the potential to bring more people than ever into the open source community, the open source process. Not just engineers and tech writers and designers, but artists, historians, sociologists, even medical professionals. And um, yesterday, I heard I was in um, a talk about applying open source methodologies to building LLMs. And one of the ways that they identified was contributing ex their own expertise, contributing to data sets, providing feedback for fine tuning, acting as a human in the loop at times. So just as open source opened up paths for people to learn, demonstrate skills and expertise, we can hope that we see the same thing for open source AI. It's rare these days that when you're applying for a software development position that you don't provide a link to your GitHub. But that only works for software developers and maybe tech writers. It doesn't work so well for other professions. So what if GitHub or something like it acts as more of a public portfolio for artists, for those historians, for people who are contributing and participating in data set verification, validation, creation, and brings more people into the fore and provides them with hopefully similar opportunities as GitHub did for developers. Lately, I've been asked a few times, mostly in private messages, why I care about this so much. Some people have actually gone so far as to speculate motives from my employer, Amazon Web Services, who I'm not speaking on behalf of today. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yes. Yeah. And I want to be clear about why I care so much. Amazon has a mass, no, I'm just kidding. Um, open source has changed my life. The opportunities I have had, the friends I have made, the problems I have solved, all of these came from the potential that open source made possible. I was the child that took apart the VCR to understand how it worked. And I just dated myself deeply what, with that statement. One of the children, I also, yes. I also did that. I think it is critical that we never stop thinking big and that we ensure that the opportunities of tomorrow are just as broad and possible, if not bigger, for my kids, for the next generation of builders, hackers, dreamers, that we hold ourselves to the highest possible standard of what it means to be open and not wash it down to something that is easy, convenient, and lazy. 
1962, President John F. Kennedy delivered a very famous speech. It was mostly written by Ted Sorensen, and I want to make sure I give him credit. He gave it to a crowd at Rice University, and he was describing why it was important that the United States go to the moon. And he said some things that have always stuck with me as I've thought about open source. He said that they do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. And I think it is critical that we do the same when we talk about open source and AI. It is hard. All of these, all of these um, things come with immense challenges. We need to be careful about how we go about them. But we also need to be very intentional. And we have to remember, open source, it isn't a short-term prospect. It is a long-term investment. If people had given up when open source didn't see mass adoption in early years, we wouldn't be where we are today. And, I, and it is crucial that we stand up for full transparency in AI, like we did in open source, so that we preserve the possibilities that we're dreaming about today. So I'd like to just thank you all for, for coming. Um, I know this is probably a little bit more of a speculative talk than a lot of the ones here today, but those are our favorite Actually, types. I've got a demo. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have a demo. Is it a resume screener? <laughs> it's not. OK. Um, but I would encourage you to think about what else might be possible, what opportunities there are for us all if we think big, we act boldly, and we stand up for what we believe in. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be around if um, people want to ask questions. I've I once again forgot to start my timer, so. Um, they didn't yank us off the stage, so we probably didn't run long. I don't know if they have hooks big enough for two people. No, well, they get one of us, they'll probably stop us. Okay, yeah. But we are happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Um, Philosophical musings, uh, papers, reference papers are always welcome as well. AWS questions, we'll do our best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anybody have a question before we get yanked off the stage? So the question is, um, how, how do you decide, basically, between going with a proprietary solution for, for AI, presumably, and, um, and open source? And I think one of the, um, there, there's a little bit of uh, a misconception in discussions about open source AI that if we push for open data as well as open the rest of it, that companies that do want to consume these open source AI systems will have to go and recompile it. And I don't, or, or retrain it, and they may not have access to the infrastructure, the, um, the, the cost alone, um, or be able to, dedicate the time and expertise to go and, and retrain models. But the thing is, is that we're not saying that people can't release models in conjunction 
pre-trained models, foundational models, in conjunction with their open source release. Um, and so the advantage that you get, that your companies get, if there's full transparency into the entire stack of the open source AI system that they're considering, is that they can evaluate it for their specific use case. They can see if it's going to be, if retraining it is going to work well for them, um, or fine tuning it is going to work well for them. Uh, they can see what value decisions have been made in the training process. Um, so it's, it's not a binary either or. There's definitely simplicity in taking a, a pre-trained model um, that may not be open source. But I think you can have that same simplicity with an open source approach as well. Um, I think there's three concepts here that, that I would focus on and try and answer that question. And I think I could probably give an hour and a half talk on that answer. Um, I think that the first measure is control. Um, some customers prefer to have complete control over their environment, and so sometimes they lean towards building their own solution. And what I've learned to help them understand is that they only have as much control as they have those people who wrote the software when they were there. And that when those people leave, they lose measure of control over that software. Even though they paid for it and they wrote it in-house, they have that. Control erode away from them over time. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the second concept, which is the concept of technical debt. And when you build something in-house, the technical debt clock starts turning, whether you want it to or not. When you buy proprietary software, the technical debt clock starts turning. When you use open source, you have a parallel path that is developing in, in the same time as you. And the risk of technical debt goes down. It doesn't go to zero, but it goes way down. And so for companies that have experienced the pain of technical debt and their dependencies, this is often a very compelling argument to get them to consider open source. And I think the last point is to think about the scope of these large models. Most companies cannot afford to train one of these models from source today. And hopefully that changes over time, because I do think it will. But if the choice is truly between an open model or a closed model to do the task, and you've decided that you're going to use an LLM for this task, why would you not choose the one that you can audit? Why would you not choose the one that you know they can't lie to you about what it does and what it knows? Uh, that seems like a very clear argument from my perspective as to why customers would want to consider having that sense of transparency, even if they never plan to contribute any bit of data or any lines of code to that effort. I do want to just point out that we clearly have a preference and an opinion, and it's pretty strong. <laughs> so we probably aren't reflecting everything that your customers or your, your okay. cust customers are going to who's next come on no, I'm just kidding. to be concerned about but I we do have a strong preference for for open and auditability is a key component especially for highly regulated industries as well so with open source AI and I hope you can join and everyone else can join and we'll share with you where we stand in comparison to what uh, was presented here which is the dream uh, <laughs> of course Okay, so we have a plug for a talk. <laughs> the next talk, not in this room, but on the fifth floor, um, as maybe a, um, a, a current state of the union on open source and AI. So check that one out. What is the talk titled? Uh, the, uh, the something, uh, open something open source AI will be on the fifth floor. Go find it. I, he I heard the word dilemma, so yeah. look for dilemma and you will find this talk. So. Excellent. Thank you, yes. sir. Thank you. Perfect. Yes.
Okay, I think we have one time for one more. Yeah. As he's running As he away. As he runs to his car. <laughs> so, uh, open source uh, based on uh, copyright law and uh, GDPR, uh, how Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I I will be the first to admit that I am not a lawyer and I have in fact been yelled at for providing legal No, I'm I'm kidding. I have not been no, yelled at. No, that was at. me. I, I do that. I give free legal advice on Reddit. Um, <laughs> don't. Sure, sure. And I think that there's a lot of very smart lawyers who have put a lot of time into thinking about this problem as it relates to different jurisdictions. But I also know that, in general, courts have been respectful of the intentions of creators. And so when creators say, I intend for this to be permissively used in a broad set of contexts, in general, courts stand behind that. And so I think that's inspirational in thinking about how we solve some of these jurisdictional challenges that exist, some of the legal ambiguity that exists. I think there is a lot of improvement that can happen at a legislative level, at a judicial level, with lawyers to address this problem. But I don't want to say, well, it's really confusing to figure out how to do this, and thus we shouldn't. Yeah, and I think it's very important to, to look back at the crafting of the open source definition. and. The, the goal there wasn't to establish the legal framework. It was to establish the philosophical one. And the legal framework came in or with that in mind. Um, as, as Spot said earlier, it was the mechanism. It wasn't the, the starting point. Um, and so there are going to undoubtedly be so many challenges with open data, and um, Anastasia's keynote this morning talked about you know, saying the quiet part out loud um, that a lot of LLMs these days are, are trained on, on data that they may not be able to provide what? as open. No, books two is fine. And, and I, think, I think we do need to, to acknowledge that um, and understand that we may have to shift what our, our mental model of what can go into these um, LLMs. But if I, were, if I were a customer of, and I was evaluating what model to use, I would want to have some degree of confidence in the above boredness of the data used to train that model. And I think that open data gets us there, even if the legal mechanisms I am not qualified to speak to, and I think they are unclear. <laughs> um, we will be around, so please, we, do, we want to make sure that the next presenter has time yes. to set up, and although maybe it's lunch, I'm not sure. No, okay. No, there is another presentation cool. in a few minutes, so thank you so much. Yes, we are easily findable, so.